Greetings and welcome to the Delta Alpha Leadership Lectures. I come to share my story of how I dealt with the tension between a nurse's person-centeredness and the tedium of research. The tension between care and statistics, if you will, felt by many of us who are called to nursing. Research is just too tedious not to use it for patient benefit and fast. The answer came in my mid-career, evidence-based practice. I set out to make evidence-based practice accessible to all frontline nurses and pragmatic in real healthcare settings. I was humbled to receive the Sigma Theta Ta Episteme Laureate designation for this EBP work. I'm pleased to share some of it with you, looking through the lens of leadership. The title of our presentation and discussion today is how to bring evidence-based practice into the workplace. For discussion today, we thought we would look at three major topics, the nature of evidence, the leader needs to understand the actual motivation and mandates behind evidence-based practice. We'll look at it through the lens of the STAR model of knowledge transformation. Implementing evidence-based practice initiatives is like moving the mountain we'll look at some of the advances made in implementing evidence-based practice. And leadership strategies and tools for moving that mountain, implementation science, evidence-based practice competencies, and the evidence-based practice readiness inventory. The movement, as you know, is based on a definition that has three parts, best research evidence, patient values, and clinical expertise. So evidence is more understood. Less understood is how to put that into action, the role of the leader. This initiative was really launched in full faith by the Institute of Medicine, now National Academies of Science, with their series called Crossing the Quality Chasm. You're familiar with the work to air as human that threw light on the, the um, improvements that needed to be made in the healthcare system. Crossing the quality chasm, although a 2001 publication still provides a blueprint for us to revise and transform healthcare. Following on this, keeping patients safe was about nurses at the pointed end of care knowing what works and clinical practice guidelines, finding what works are all three about the form of knowledge that is most helpful within the healthcare setting. We want to improve health through care, through focusing on outcomes, through reducing cost, increasing value, and through enhancing the workplace environment. But here's the challenge. We look at bench research results. This happens to be the t-test that tests the difference between the experimental group and the control group, or the regular group, if you will. And you look at this and see that this is what's reported in the journals, but yet we want to bring it to the bedside care. So this struck an idea of looking at knowledge transformation from moving from an individual primary care or primary research project into something that's useful at the bedside. The STAR model of knowledge transformation has five points. Discovery research, we're very familiar with that. It's in our research textbooks. Evidence summary, you'll remember some of the topics that we talk about as we talk about systematic reviews translating the evidence into recommendations and guidelines, looking at practice integration, and then measuring the process, the outcome, so that we can sustain or make course corrections. The STAR model really is about, at its center, clinical decision-making. 
It asks, what intervention will most likely diminish the health problem? We have come to find in nursing science that it's the observations that we make that are systematically studied. In other words, research gives us the best answer about the most effective intervention. Evidence-based clinical decision-making can be defined as a prescriptive approach to making choices based on the idea that research-based care improves outcome. As a matter of fact, it's demonstrated in uh, journal articles that this is true. Clinical knowledge is the basis for our direct care. So the IOM talked about the impetus of evidence-based practice by pointing to quality of care lagging behind knowledge. That knowledge is the evidence-based practice. As a matter of fact, in 1990, the Institute of Medicine defined quality of care, and I'll highlight some words in these. It's the degree to which the health services that we offer as nurses to individual patients, populations, families, it's the degree to which that increases the likelihood of getting them to the outcome we intend. In other words, to move the needle with them and their health situation. And the degree to which these are consistent with current professional knowledge. So even in 1990, evidence-based practice was brewing. In 2001, Crossing the Quality Chasm showed us a report card to provide some impetus for us to really get on the ball and move evidence that we had in the care. They pointed to this report card, which is not very good. 47% of MI patients didn't receive beta blockers. 50% of children didn't receive instructions. All these are known best practices. 48% of the elderly didn't receive their flu vaccine. 63% of smokers were not advised to quit smoking. We know that's effective in smoking cessation. 84% of Medicare patients with diabetes had no hemoglobin A1C test. So this was a very big uh, awakening and a highlight on quality of care lagging behind knowledge. In the Crossing the Quality Care book, the quality chasm was seen to be crossed as using evidence-based practice as a solution. As a matter of fact, in Chapter 6, the recommendation is that evidence-based decision-making should be used. Patients should receive care based on the best available scientific knowledge, not anything less. Care should not vary illogically from clinician to clinician or from place to place. That second statement is a bit of a puzzlement to a nurse because we pride ourselves on individualizing care. But we'll find in quality improvement that when care is standardized to the scientific knowledge, that care doesn't vary from clinician to clinician or from place to place. So the next point about the impetus is if quality of care lags behind knowledge and evidence-based practice is seen as a solution, we wonder how is it a solution exactly? In other words, how do we get from there that research study on the shelf to here in the clinical decision. Returning to the evidence-based practice definition, we see that Sackett originally identified these as the traditional best research evidence combined with patient values and clinical expertise. And this is, I call the RAGU definition because it's all in there, evidence-based practice has all three aspects. So here we are understanding evidence-based practice, but what are the hurdles in terms of getting this into every practice? One is the volume of literature. 100 new trials a day mm, hasn't been indexed in nursing, but this is in the medical literature. IOM pointed out that no unaided human being can read and recall and act effectively on the volume of clinically relevant scientific literature. So the volume is one hurdle. The second hurdle is the form of knowledge. 
not every knowledge source is suitable for informing clinical decisions in that real world setting. So in looking at the hurdle and the solution, one obstacle in moving research rapidly into patient care is the growing volume. And evidence-based practice brings us a solution in systematic reviews that reduce the volume and the complexity of all the different studies on a particular topic. They're all integrated into a meaningful whole, a great evidence-based practice solution. Another hurdle was the form of knowledge. The literature contains many forms, most of which are not suitable for direct practice application, as we saw in the t-test. Knowledge transformation, however, converts increasing and increases the meaning to the clinician and to the utility in clinical decision making. The conversion is explained by something that's simply called the Stephen Starr model of knowledge transformation. So again, we see the five points of the star and identifying where we go to, to discover these forms of knowledge. I've offered some ideas of what it looks like on point one, these research journals. Point two, we go to different places. For example, the Cochrane Collaboration Systematic Review database. Joanna Briggs has a wonderful database. HRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality also does. On point three, the guidelines or the recommendations you can see very good examples from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. On point four, these end up being policy recommendations for action in the clinical settings. And on point five, we look to National Quality Forum, the Centers for Medicare Medicaid, and Joint Commission for some of the uh, indicators of where we would be looking for particular forms of knowledge. I'm reminded that on point four of this star, the patient preference and th our tradition and our policy is added to this implementation point. And on point five, our experience as expert nurses, along with trial and error, can be added. So again, um, there, there's a place for each and every form of knowledge. The knowledge transformation that has to occur is moving research findings from those single research studies on point one of the star through a series of stages to impact on health outcomes and demonstrate that improvement. So what did these look like? Well, returning to the star model, point one, discovery research. Here's an example of a single trial, and I'll point out the third bullet. Whatever the research design, the conclusion was this simple home-based exercise program showed a reduction in fear of falling and a positive trend toward exercise adherence. Now, what if we were the clinical practice committee and we're trying to define a fall prevention program? Would this single study tell us actually what to do? What are the recommendations? So this finding is not very useful in guiding recommendations. So if we move on around the transformation of the knowledge, we look to evidence summary where all research is synthesized into a single meaningful statement of the state of the, of the, state of the knowledge. This evidence summary is a key part in what happened with evidence-based practice. Systematic reviews became the all for summarizing the world's knowledge on whether or not an intervention worked. And along with that, the strength of evidence became identified as the strongest up here as evidence summaries. At the same time, all forms of knowledge still count. Qualitative studies, expert opinion, your expertise as a nurse, as a leader, theory, basic science, the non-experimental studies, the experimental studies, RCTs, but each one of these is trumped whenever a systematic review is conducted. So all of a sudden we have these diamonds in our world of knowledge and to demonstrate that this is a search 
uh, on falls prevention. Again, if our uh, clinical practice committee says, let's do a falls prevention program, perhaps you're charged with finding the literature. Well, recently there were almost 6,000 citations on falls prevention, so you don't want to wheel that back into your committee meeting. But if you limit it to research, um, that's better, but there's still over 2,000 citations. Now that we have systematic reviews in our purview, we can limit to systematic reviews. There's a 168 citations, but if we're looking for prevention in the elderly, there's one systematic review. So this is truly like finding a gold mine. What does a systematic review look like? Well, it's different than a single research study because they typically do end up having about 30 trials. This one was a big systematic review with 62 trials involving over 21,000 people, which you know strengthens the conclusion. Uh, and these were the uh, activities that um, prevented falls in elderly, uh, multi-factor risk screening, muscle strengthening, um, hazard assessment, withdrawal of unneeded psychotropic medication, uh, cardiac pacing for some groups, and Tai Chi. Um, so uh, this again was updated, um, this is the most recent in the Cochrane Library. Sounds very different than a single research uh, study. So next we translate this into guidelines. The point two of the STAR, all the world's knowledge on whether or not that intervention worked, is translated into a summary of scientific evidence and clinical expertise is added to it to result in a practice recommendation. We call these clinical practice guidelines or evidence-based guidelines. Uh, best practice uh, uh, is becoming used, but the Institute of Medicine really proposed that clinical practice guidelines were part of the heart of evidence-based quality improvement. So Knowing What Works was published in 2008, and then clinical practice guidelines um, was published in 2011. Uh, both systematic reviews, point two of the star, and guidelines, point three of the star, were identified as the critical link between research and clinical decision making. So what are guidelines? We use this term frequently. Guidelines are a convenient way of packaging the evidence and presenting recommendations to healthcare decision makers, that is you, the leaders. So leaders have guidelines that are practiced, uh, that are packaged and programs that are actually uh, produced with beautiful graphics and toolkits. So guidelines sound very useful, don't they? Here's an example of one. U.S. Preventive Services Task Force for Colorectal Cancer Screening. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force strongly recommends that clinicians screen men and women 50 years of age or older for colorectal cancer. Now this is in flux. There are some newer studies, but we're all pretty much in that same arena. I wanted to show this to you because a good guideline will tell you the rating of the recommendation. This is A. It's very strong. It goes all the way to perhaps insufficient or inconclusive. But in this case, there was good evidence that periodic fecal occult blood testing reduces mortality from colorectal cancer and fair evidence that the scope alone or in combination reduces death. So this is a very important point three of the star because now we have the recommendation. This is for assessment of falls in older people and you'll recall the point two systematic review and see some of it uh, embedded in this recommendation. Uh, it's an A-level recommendation, evidence level one, that all older people with recurrent falls are at risk of falling should be considered for 
multifactorial intervention. And you see some of the components, strength and balance training that was in the systematic review home hazards, that was in the systematic review. Medication review was in the systematic review. However, vision assessment was added. Remember, we can add things on point three of the star from our clinical expertise, although there was not a particular research study found and included in the systematic review, you go, it makes sense as an expert. So the STAR model of tra knowledge transformation moves us around to practice integration of that recommendation. However, integration requires a change, a change in professional practice at the individual at the organizational and at the environmental levels. Now you see where the leadership comes in. So let's look at the actors that are involved in moving that mountain. Well, first of all, from point one, two to point three, we employ knowledge workers. We want the people who are scientists connected with clinicians to translate that to point three of the clinical recommendations uh, for us to take action on. And then at that point, leaders and change agents pick up the recommendations and move it into implementation and sustainment. So there are the actors in moving the mountain. So the evidence work, the knowledge workers get the evidence straight. We have to get it right or else we could be doing the wrong thing. The leaders and change agents get the straight evidence used. And then finally, the leaders and sustainers get the outcomes measured. So how are these important uh, within the evaluation or point five of the STAR. The impact of the change is measured on health outcome, on satisfaction of both the client and the provider, on the efficacy, the efficiency, the health status impact, and importantly, the economic analysis. So it always costs something to change. An example of a measure that we would shoot for is from the Healthy People 2020. Let's look at the flu vaccine. This is identifying that the target is 70% of people vaccinated. The CDC reported that as, as of 2018, about 45% had received the flu vaccine. Where do other measures come from? Joint Commission gives us measures. They urge us to use uh, never events and uh, zero falls incidents. Medicare and Medicaid, the VA all provide um, measures for us. Here's where leaders are required on point four and point five of the STAR. This is where the talent as a leader helps us move all the way around the points of the STAR model. This particular quote is in the front of every single Institute of Medicine crossing the quality chasm or quality chasm report. There are about 20 of them now. Let's look at it. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Willing is not enough. We must do. So under knowing is not enough. We must apply. We must apply evidence to knowledge to decision. We have to apply strategies that work to make the change. For willing is not enough, leaders must motivate willingness. However that's done, the incentives, the um, audit feedback, the education is not sufficient but necessary, and, uh, and shape behavior through reinforcing that new behavior as it occurs. It's been said that if we continue to do what we've always done, we'll get the results we've always gotten. Paul Plessick, as a matter of fact, wrote this in one of the IOM quality chasm reports. Implementation of a clinical practice guideline or best practice implies change. 
and here's what our colleagues hear. You as a leader say, I'm here to change your practice for the best to the new standard of practice in, in science. What people hear is, I'm from the IRS and I'm here to help. So we know about change several things. Let me give you the context of our environment and what change might look like in our environment. This is a very busy acute care unit. It could be a very busy uh, outpatient unit. So this is the context, the complex adaptive system in which the National Patient Safety Goals introduced a goal to reduce the risk of healthcare associated infections. And you can read this. It includes hand wash it and includes the things that you use with patients. Here's a context of a very busy team at work. It looks like they're doing a great job. The quality improvement target that we'd like to discuss in this case study is that stethoscopes are used repeatedly throughout the day and they become contaminated after each patient exposure. So they must be treated as potential vectors of transmission. You see the potential pathogens that have been cultured and the, the uh, call to action, failing to disinfect stethoscopes is a patient safety issue. You can lead a provider to disinfectants, but how do you get them to clean or wipe or swab a stethoscope? Linda Green's quote, she is president of the Association of Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. So the evidence was that there was a gap. Physicians' stethoscopes were more contaminated than the palms of their hands. Failures in stethoscope hygiene can lead to patient infection. And alcohol swabs or hand sanitizers are acceptable and equivalent and readily available. So setting the expectation for stethoscope hygiene between each encounter was going to be the best practice. Non-critical medical equipment undergoes disinfection between patients. There's two citations of why this is best practice. So the question was, can education influence stethoscope hygiene? This leader said, we need to change we need to change the practice. We need to improve this practice. So a program was put into place. PowerPoint slides and education, alcohol swabs and sanitizers were uh, made available or, or um, plentiful supply. The expectation was shared and laminated the reminders were, were placed around. Did education influence stethoscope hygiene? Hand hygiene rates did not change. Stethoscope hygiene is rarely done. They reported a, a rate of zero change. So the conclusion about provider education and flyers and cleaning supplies and educational efforts was that it was not effective in changing practice. Remember, it's hard to change. Why did the project change? Well, the nature of the evidence. Uh, was there implementation initiatives, moving the mountain strategies that could have worked? The big reason is that change is painful. Change is painful. We have to give up our familiar and adopt and become a novice with whatever the replacement is. So what do leaders do? They build knowledge bridges from discovery to utilization to health outcomes and must lead change in individuals and care teams that reinforce each other and organizations that help with policy and leadership and external policy. But you live in a complex adaptive system, so it requires a bridge that looks more like this. And yes, this is a real bridge um, in the world, um, but looking at how to cross the chasm between best practice and current practice. So what's on new, what's new on the scene is implementation science, which is a systematically organized knowledge, body of knowledge about strategies 
if the PowerPoint slides and the plastic card didn't work, what, what does work? And so implementation science is building that kind of knowledge through implementation research. We're examining two kinds of outcomes, both the practice process and the strategy used to push that process uh, toward improvement and the effectiveness in the patient outcome. Again, we're like looking at trying to explain change. How do we explain change? There are a number of ways to do it. Let's look at the idea of adoption, adoption of an innovation. And I know that you've heard of Everett M. Rogers and his theory of diffusion of innovation. It's the most quoted in the field of implementation and evidence-based practice. You have different groups in, under your leadership purview. This first group is just, I mean, they're the maverick innovators, right? And then the early adopters said, hey, I found this really awesome tool. There's early majority and late majority. It's like, I wish I would, I wish I'd tried using this a little bit earlier. It's great. And then there's, this is Roger's word, my, not mine, laggards, who say, I suppose we can try. Will you help me? At least there's an open mind there. But here's the leadership challenge. What's the strategy for each group? The innovators, you, they say, hey, cool, look at this. And you may end up needing to help uh, regulate how often innovation is introduced and making sure that the evidence is convincing and that that top, top peak of the strength of evidence. The early adopters say, hey, I'm willing to use that. Let me try this out. And the early majority say, let's agree about what and how to do this. So there's an interesting group um, on the left-hand side of this bell-shaped curve. Leadership seems to be easier with that group. The late majority says, okay, so we're going to use this, just tell me how. So that's where leaders use championing, uh, let's try it out on one unit, let's see if it spreads, um, give me input about what would make it work on your unit. And then there's the laggards. And um, the laggards sound like this. I don't need all this. This could last as long as I do. So laggards are a special case. Um, there's literature talking about how to really leverage the outlook from a laggard to inform and make sure that the sustainment of the innovation is not undercut. So there's something for leaders to uh, think further about. I've also heard uh, leaders talk about new ideas about inviting people off the bus. If they can't get on board with the learning healthcare system that you're creating, then maybe they'd be more helpful in another situation. So um, this slide is where in implementation research is going. It's called the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. What I want you to see in this slide as a leader is the, the big chunks. There's the outer setting, the context of making change, the inner setting. What is the unit? How does that team work? And then the individuals involved. Also, down at the bottom, you'll see a lot of PDSA cycles, and you're familiar with PDS, Plan, Do, Study, Act, quality improvement cycles. So while the CFER looks complicated, um, it's a, a very helpful model to think about taking your left-sided uh, core components of your intervention, the best practice, and fitting them to the, the particular environment the organizational climate and readiness. And on the left hand, on the right hand side, you see that now the intervention has been adapted to fit well. Here's another thing I'll just point out because it's so foundational. Um, the source is there, but there's three major chunks in Greenhaw's uh, look at spread and dissemination and implementation. First is the characteristics of the discovery or the change, the innovation, the characteristics of it. Is it easy to do? Is it observable? Then there's the characteristics of the potential adopter. 
Are they like early adopters, laggards? Where do they fall? Do they really bounce off of each other as a team and help to reinforce through their social network? And then there are the environmental factors, the opinion leaders and the regulation. And do you even have the funds to purchase the supplies that are needed? So changing practice is a team sport and teams need somebody to lead. Leadership is not necessarily an endowment. It's a proficiency that can be in, uh, developed and it can also be shared. Sometimes I'm a great follower, but I choose to be that role and declare it as such because there can be a lead uh, and that lead can rotate according to the particular um, challenge that the team is going after particular quality improvement initiative or best practice implementation. So in teaming, there's the whole science of teaming. It's largely a spun out of a variety of things, but a lot of it comes from uh, Cotter's theory of leading and change, leading change management. And there are eight steps of change. So as a leader, you would become very um, informed about creating a sense of urgency. Oh my gosh, we need to do something to build a guiding team and develop that change vision and strategy. Here's where we're going. Understanding and buy-in from the top down, from the bottom up. Do we understand this? What else is it going to take? Empowering others, empowering the entire team and, and identifying short term wins like we did this part. We got from A to B. How can we get from B to C? And once we get our pilot done, where can we spread it? And don't let up. Be relentless. If this is something that's going to improve patient safety and patient outcomes, then we have uh, that passion in our nursing makeup to have that done. And then finally, you weave this into a new care culture. And you can find out more about leading change management in this book. If you've taken team steps, you understand our iceberg is melting, a story of a colony of penguins facing a dilemma about their current situation changing. And there were all kind of resistors and proponents, but it contains within the story a powerful message about the fear of change and how to motivate people. Sustaining change is a leader's obligation. Once we've achieved it through change agents and champions and experts and practice facilitators, one thing that really helps is to evaluate how far along you've come in correcting that gap. Return on investment is a way to look at that. Net profit on investment versus the cost of investment is the return on investment. This kind of uh, evaluation is less often prefer performed, but here's a study of return on investment for vaccinating children. And you see that for each dollar invested, there's a $16 return on investment in saving healthcare costs, lost wages, and productivity due to illness. So is it worth it? Is looking at patient safety and quality improvement evidence-based practice worth it? I say yes, we've made progress. Although the report card was daunting, we show that we have improved these health, these safety issues. They've dropped by 13%. So this is a decline in hospital acquired conditions in particular. So we've looked at um, the nature of evidence and um, what we can gain through the STAR model. I wanted to highlight for you again leadership strategies and tools for moving that mountain. The suite of evidence-based practice tools um, that were developed were developed around the STAR model with the five points of transforming knowledge. It was developed and extended into essential competencies for evidence-based practice in nursing, the basic competencies, intermediate competencies, and advanced competencies were developed by a national consensus. There are 20 basic 
competencies. We took these and developed a readiness inventory. And these have been used in research studies. They've been used in um, organizations where evidence-based practice was stood up as a goal, perhaps maybe for magnet recognition. And uh, you can do a pre-post using the evidence-based practice readiness inventory. Please contact me if you're interested uh, in these. They're available to you. We'll entertain questions and comments uh, right after this live presentation. I did want to point out that there are some resources included uh, for you to dig a little deeper and to conclude with the comment that we must lead healthcare improvement. Because Peter Drucker reminds us that the best way to predict the future is to create it. Thank you very much for allowing me to share some of this EBP information for leaders.